So uh, for the devotion, our, our small study today, um, I wanted to um, read in the book of Acts. So Acts chapter 22. <clears throat> Acts chapter 22. Um, in this passage, we'll read just the first um, 11 verses. <clears throat> in this passage, there are two questions, and that's really what I want to tackle or discover, or talk about tonight. There are two questions. The first question is a question I believe that all of us have to deal with and have to answer maybe even more than all of us. I, I think the whole world actually needs to answer this question. And then the second question really comes based on the response to the first question. So hopefully we'll get that from this passage. Um, Acts chapter 22, um, I'm just going to read it really quickly. Brethren and fathers, hear my defense, which I offer to you. And when they heard, that he was addressing them in the Hebrew dialect, they became even more quiet. And he said, I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in the city, educated under Gamaliel, strictly according to the law of the, our fathers, being zealous for God, just as you all are today. I persecuted this way to the death binding and putting both men and women into prisons, as also the high priest and all the council of the elders can testify. From then, I also received letters to the brethren and started off for Damascus in order to bring even those who were there to Jerusalem as prisoners to be punished. But it happened that as I was on my way approaching Damascus, about noonish, uh, a very bright light suddenly flashed from heaven all around me, and I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus, the Nazarene, whom you are persecuting. And those who were with me saw the light, to be sure but did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. And I said, what shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, get up and go on into Damascus. And there you will be told of all that has been appointed for you to do. But since I could not see because of the brightness of that light, I was led by the hand by those who were with me and came into Damascus. So we'll stop reading there. Uh, and let's just pray for a minute. Great God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. And we thank you that we could read it and study it. And we pray that it would speak to our hearts, even for me. And that we would learn from it, we grow from it. And that it would be food for us, spiritual food and nourishment. And let it lead to change and transformation. So that we could live a life that would honor you. We thank you and praise you in Lord Jesus' precious name. Amen. So as you can see from this passage, we are talking, uh, this is um, Paul giving a defense of him uh, in, in the midst of Jewish leaders. Um, he, this is interesting here in Acts chapter 22, because really what in this passage in Acts chapter 22, he's really recalling when he's, when he's been asked to give a defense, his defense becomes his testimony. And the testimony is really the testimony of his conversion, of his salvation. And that really speaks to what's happening in Acts chapter 9. So we read in Acts chapter 9, this conversion story when he is known as Saul. And we know this story of Saul, of he who was a zealous Jewish leader, uh, a Pharisee, one who was, uh, and he, he lists out the different um, accomplishments or his credentials, um, you know, being uh, zealous for God, uh, being strictly um, educated and um, brought up under Gamaliel. Um, and we see that all of that is part of his testimony. But really, we read this account here in, in Acts chapter 22, but it really speaks of Acts chapter 9. And then he gives another account of this same testimony in Acts chapter 26, when he is in front of King Agrippa. 
But I wanted to pick this passage because I think it's important because I hope you caught the two questions that I wanted to kind of look into and, and study uh, today, right? So the first question we see is in verse eight. So before we go into verse eight, let's just read in verse, verse seven. We see the Lord calling out to Saul. And he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And the first, and the first question we read here is, and I answered, who are you, Lord? You know, that's this, that's the question, that's the first question I wanted to, to, to really study. And remember when I said in the beginning, this is a question I think that we all have to answer. And in fact, I think the whole world needs to answer. Who are you, Lord? Or in other words, who is Jesus to you? Who is Jesus to me? The whole world needs to address and needs to answer for that question. Who is this Jesus? And this is the first response that he has, Saul, to the question that, that Christ poses to him. Now, just look here. He is frightened by a bright light. You know, there's a, a loud voice. He falls to the ground and he's realizing something heavenly, something divine is happening here. But it's interesting to me, this Saul, who is so educated into the word, this Saul, who knew the Old Testament scriptures, who was a Pharisee, one without blame, one, if he was a true Jew, was really one who was looking for the Messiah who was anticipating the Messiah. And yet, when the voice of the Lord called to him, you see, he said, who are you, Lord? Yeah, you get a sense that Saul did not realize, Saul did not know, did not understand who was calling out to him. This voice that spoke to him, he did not know. I know he used the word Lord, but the word Lord here has different connotations based on the context. And you can sense that this word Lord is being used is really just a word that's being talked about someone who is speaking with authority or power, um, but not really Lord as in Lord and Savior. Um, so we see here, who are you, Lord? And that's really the first question I want to ask all of us. Who is Jesus to you? Who is Jesus to me? Who is Jesus to us? You know, God calls out to you and me, and he confronts every person to answer the question, who is Jesus, and who is Jesus to, to you, and who is Jesus to us? And, and I want to be clear, right? When we ask this question, who is Jesus, it's not really asking about how much do you know about Jesus, or how much do you know about God? You know, look, again, like I mentioned, Saul knew about God. He was educated. He was zealous. He even did things for the purpose of his religion, believing that that was God's will and purpose. Um, and just like that, we also may know about God. We may know about Christ. We may know about salvation. We all hear messages. We hear, we go to attend Bible studies. We uh, listen through Sunday school lessons. We can go through the motions of Christianity and religion. We can go through the, uh, we can, we can sit under the word of elders and, 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 and uh, Sunday school teachers and even parents and even in the family and be so caught up in Christianity and so caught up in knowing about Christianity that you can almost trick yourself into believing that you are, that makes you a Christian. And what we see here that even with Saul, who was so involved in his religion, still could not sense the voice of the Messiah when he called out. He could not sense the voice of the Lord when he called. He says, who are you, Lord? You know, we see from scripture examples of those who, when they are confronted with the Lord, they respond accordingly. Uh, in, P in, in Luke chapter 9, we read of Peter's confession. You know, Christ um, 
asks his disciples, who do you say I am? It's really the, the same question here. Who, who are you, Lord? Or who is Jesus? Who am I to you? Who do you say I am? And you know what Peter uh, responds? In, in Luke chapter 9, he responds, the Christ of God. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 15, a little bit more context and a little bit more description. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. You can sense that Peter's relationship with the Lord was tied into that response. You know, even before he responds to that, he, he talks about how others view him, right? Some call him a prophet. Some call him uh, a wise teacher. Some call him many other things. But who do you say I am? Do you believe that I am the son of God? Do you believe who, you, who I say that I am? And Martha also has a confession in John chapter 11, verse 27, when Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. And then he says, do you believe this truth? And you know what Martha says there? He says, she says, yes, Lord. I have believed that you are the Christ, the son of God, even he who comes into the world. That is the confession. That is the response to that question. Who is Jesus to us? Who is this Lord to us? I think it, I, I hope that it, it, it is a, it is a, it is a reminder as a spark to you as well, that, that you would also ask that question of yourself. Who is Jesus to you? If he were to speak to you today, would you recognize his voice? Or would you, like Saul, say, who are you? Um, you know, this evening, it sounds like, you know, you may say another gospel, but I really want to make sure, right? I want to invite you to know the Lord Jesus as your personal Savior. And this happens not with head knowledge, not just about religion, but it happens with relationship. When you surrender your life to him and, uh, and enter into a relationship with him. John chapter 10, verse 27, it says, my sheep hear my voice. When God calls you and when God responds to you, or when God calls out to you, do you hear his voice? Okay. We'll go to the second question. And like I said in the beginning, the answer and your response to the first question will then lead to the second question. We see that Saul, when he asked, who are you, Lord? He got to the point where he didn't know. But you know what's amazing about Saul here is that his response shows the transformation that happened in his life. Now we, we, we come down to verse um, 10. So verse 8, he says, uh, who are you, Lord? And then Jesus says, I am Jesus the Nazarene, whom you persecuting. You know, I want to take a brief second there. If you go to Acts chapter 26, there's an interesting thing that I was reading, and I was like, huh, interesting. Um, um, Acts chapter 26, verse 9, it says, so then I thought to myself that I had to do many things hostile to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. What does that mean? That means that um, Saul thought in his wisdom that he would do anything and everything in his power to bring down this name of Jesus of Nazareth. He, he, he fully believed that this Jesus, whom all these Christians were running around saying, uh, you know, believe in Jesus. He was the Messiah. He is the Savior. His, his whole um, his wisdom said, no, Jesus is not the Messiah. And this Jesus of Nazareth, he, he wanted to do everything and anything and everything he could to bring down this name, to, to create hostility against this name for anyone who held on to this name. Now you see the beauty of chapter 22 and verse 9. What does he say? Who are you, Lord? And it's interesting to note what Jesus' response is. What is it? It's that same name that he wanted to create hostility against. It says what? I am Jesus the Nazarene, whom you are persecuting. 
Now, I want to share with you the second question, because like I mentioned, it comes off of this response. When he is confronted with the Lord Jesus and the Lord reveals who he is, he reveals that, hey, I am Jesus, the Nazarene, the one you want to persecute, the one who's, um, who those believers, uh, um, you know, you're going after. And you see in the next question that um, Saul asks, the life transformation that happens in verse 10, and it says, and I said, what shall I do, Lord? Did you see what, did you see what happened there? First, he asked, who are you, Lord? He could not recognize the voice that was being, uh, that was speaking to him. But once he was confronted with the truth of who this Jesus was, his immediate response was, what shall I do, Lord? You know, it's interesting. You know, he could have sat back and in amazement and he could have had a time of contemplation and he could have been like, wow, you know, really dwelling in this new realization that, hey, this Jesus who I thought, you know, there's no way he's the Messiah, but he actually is and he is the son of God and he spoke to me now. I mean, he could have been all in his feelings and thoughts and ideas and realizations. He could have even had doubts. And he could have even asked more questions. You know, what? how could this be? And, and how, how can this happen this way? But it's amazing to me, the immediate response that happens. The immediate response is, what shall I do, Lord? And I think that speaks to, again, like I mentioned, the transformation that happened immediately in the life of Saul. We see two things that happened to his heart immediately with this question. When he asked this question, what shall I do, Lord? Um, you see that this, this heart that was filled, you know, again, you are talking about a religious wise man, his Pharisee who knew the Old Testament, filled with the wisdom of, of Hebrew knowledge and Old Testament knowledge, uh, who was considered blameless and Pharisee. And now he's confronted with Christ and he comes down to this question and he just says, what shall I do, Lord? You see in that picture, number one, a heart of surrender. He goes from knowing it all to saying, I don't know anything. What shall I do? Instead of listening to his own voice and thinking that he knows what the word and what the, the, the law said, he, he, in this question, he is now submitting himself, surrendering himself to a new voice a new Lord. So we see in this question a heart of surrender. The second thing I, th I think we see here is a heart of obedience. Saul goes again from this religious wise man, Pharisee, enforcer, you know, he's a zealot who, who, you know, he thinks he's doing God's purpose and God's will. He thinks that by going after these Christians and persecuting them and really going after the church, he was doing the service of God, the will of God. But you know, when he was confronted with the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ, you see in this question, what shall I, what shall I do, Lord? You see not only a heart of surrender, but a heart of obedience. He suddenly realizes that the mission and the purpose that he thought God had in his life was not real, was not what was, what was real and what was good and what God had truly intended and purposed. But instead, he says, what shall I do? An obedient heart. He, he was ready to receive a new mission, a new purpose, a new work, one that would be truly in service of God, one that would be in line in the will of God and to the glory of God. And we see here, uh, we see in this passage, actually in, we see in the passage in uh, Acts chapter 26 that it's explained to him why, what his purpose is. He is to be one, um, uh, one whom, who, who is, goes out to the Gentiles and, and teaches and, and shares the gospel and, and brings a light to them. So that now being the new purpose. So again, I wanted to just point that out. What shall I do, Lord? A heart of surrender, a heart of obedience. And really, you can see this heart posture 
in Philippians chapter 3, verse 8, when, when Paul confesses that, hey, all these acc accolades that I had, all these accomplishments, the wisdom and the, and, and the power that I had as a Pharisee and the, and, and the enforcement that I was able to do to, to punish all these, all of that, he says, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, and count them rubbish, which means useless, worthless, so that I may gain Christ. All of that was worthless. Everything came to now knowing God, to, to now gaining Christ. That was his new heart. In this question, what shall I do? You know, that's what I really wanted to share with you. And I think and what I really want to challenge you this evening is really that if you have responded to the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal savior and you know who he is, you know, there is no who are you, Lord? He is the savior of your life. Then I'm going to tell you this, right? If the question to if the answer to question one is solid in your mind and heart and you are firm in your faith in knowing the Lord Jesus Christ is your savior, then the response, Saul's response should be our response as well. Then I ask you and challenge you with this question. Are you asking of the Lord, what shall I do, Lord? That is the automatic response that we see. What shall I do, Lord? I want, and it's not just Saul. You might think that, hey, this is just one passage. You, you know, this automatic response of being revealed of the Lord Jesus, or when God calls you, this automatic response of what shall I do? We actually see this as a recurring theme. When, when, when Christ, we see this in the Gospels, when Christ approaches the disciples, what, is, uh, what, what does he say? He, 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 he reveals himself, he comes to, to the disciples and he says, follow me. And what, what does scripture say? In Matthew chapter 4, verse 19, when he is out to meet the fishermen, the, the, those who are casting out the nets, and he says, follow me. Do you know what it says? It says, immediately they left their nets and followed him. In, in Matthew chapter 9, verse 9, when he confronted Matthew, the tax collector, um, and he said, follow me. You know what Matthew did? He didn't wait. He didn't, he didn't just hang out. He didn't, he didn't say, okay, let me, uh, you know, let me do my, finish my tax collecting. And then I will get, nope. He got up and followed him. They, they purposed in their heart the same question. What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said, follow me. And they followed him. You know, there's also another word, uh, another question you can say, um, or another uh, concept around this, what shall I do, Lord, is also um, shared in scripture repeatedly with the statement, here I am. So in this passage, we read Saul, Saul's response to the Lord Jesus Christ as saying, what shall I do, Lord? We see throughout scripture over and over again that there are many characters in the Bible who, when confronted with the Lord, instead of asking, what shall I do? They just say, here I am. Genesis chapter 22, Abraham says, here I am. Jacob in Genesis 46 Moses in Exodus 3, 4, in the, in the, uh, you know, with a burning bush. Uh, Samuel, we, we all, all know of Samuel, um, who God speaks to. And, and Samuel says something a little bit different. He doesn't say, here I am. He says, speak for your servant is listening. Again, a posture of surrender, a posture of obedience. Uh, Isaiah, when, when God calls and asks, uh, kind of not directly to Isaiah, but out and he says whom shall i send and who will go for us what does isaiah say here i am send me and then you know another person who is also called out who also says here i am it's actually the character right underneath this passage in acts chapter 22 i didn't read it but i will just share it with you it says here in chapter 22 verse 12 a certain ananias a man who was devout by the standard of the law and well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there came to, to, to me. Um, hold on, let me see, make sure I got it here. I think that's in. 
Sorry, that's in Acts chapter 9. Sorry. Acts chapter 22 is a description of Saul's, um, uh, of what Ananias did. But Acts chapter 9 speaks of um, actually God calling out Ananias. And here's where it is. Acts chapter 9, verse 10. It says, now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, here I am, Lord. So the challenge I have for you is really that. If you are a child of God, if you are in a relationship with God, if you believe that Jesus is your personal savior, if you believe he is the son of God, if you say who he is in your life, if you believe that with all your heart, then there is a response that we are all to, also to have in the Lord. What shall I do, Lord? Or here I am, Lord. Or speak, your servant is listening. We have to have that heart of surrender that heart of obedience, ready to do what God has called us to do in our life. That's the challenge I want to have this evening. Now, you might say, how can I really put this action into my life? You know, how, how can I actually do what God wants me to do? How do I know what God wants me to do in my life? And I'll just say, start small, right? It starts, first of all, in your quiet time, in your relationship with the Lord. Can Do you have that time with the Lord where you are hearing his voice, that you can recognize his voice? That happens and is built upon your quiet time with him, in your devotion with him, in reading scripture, in praying. That's how you build that sense and understanding of hearing God's word being spoken to you, hearing the voice of God in your life. And then once you hear the voice of God, it should be what? What shall I do? Here I am. What do you want me to do? And this is where I would share with you that in your time of prayer, ask the Lord, how is it that God can direct you to be a godly influence to serve him wherever you are? You can be in school. You could be in work. You can be in church, wherever you are. How can God use you? What can God do through you? What can God uh, use you to do? You know, how can I be obedient? And how can I be a God? Again, start small. You know, you might look at Saul and say, hey, this is, this is Saul you're talking about. This is, you're talking about one of the greatest apostles and, and evangelists in, in all of, you know, Christianity. You're talking about Paul. I mean, I can't compared to Paul, I'm not asking you to compare yourself to Paul. I'm asking you to just start small and asking of yourself just and asking the Lord this question. How? What can I do? What shall I do, Lord? What can I do for you and for your Lord? And like I mentioned, start small. Think about what can you do in your family to be a godly influence in your family? How can you lift up your brother and your sister? How can you be an encouragement to your dad and your mom? How can you be a, 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 a pillar of strength, spiritual strength in your family? You know, how can I be a positive influence, a godly influence in church? How can I be a godly influence at school? How can I be a godly influence at work? God is asking, can you be faithful in some of these things in your life now? Start small. What is the little things that I can do in my life? And asking God, God, in this situation, in my family, in my work, in my school, amongst my friends, amongst my church friends, amongst my, those whom I come across, what shall I do, Lord? Here I am. Take me and use me. Show me what you want to accomplish in my life. And that's my challenge to you that you would lay yourself open for the Lord to use you however he desires. What shall I do, Lord? The last little piece before I close. I want to go back to Acts chapter 22 here. And I want to just bring out one or two points about the question, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? 
First of all, I want to say, or I want to share this term, Saul, Saul, whenever you see in scripture that the term, the, the name of the person is repeated twice, uh, it's known as a term of endearment. It's known as, a, as someone whom God has a close and endeared relationship with. And that's amazing to think, considering that this is Saul, Saul who persecuted the church, who was killing Christians. And yet when God addressed him, he addressed him as Saul, Saul. If you go throughout scripture, I'll just point it out to you, and you can look up the passages. God uses this term or repeats the first name uh, of, the, uh, of the person who he, who he is addressing multiple times. He says, when he calls Abraham, and Abraham says, here I am, do you know what God calls Abraham? He says, Abraham, Abraham. And then Abraham responds, says, here I am. With Jacob, he says, Jacob, Jacob. And then Jacob says, here I am. With Moses, he says, Moses, Moses. And Moses responds, here I am. He says, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel says, um, uh, uh, speak, Lord. Your servant li listens. He, he spoke to Martha. He, he said, Martha, Martha. He told Simon, Simon, Simon. And here he said, Saul, Saul. A close relationship. I, I, the reason I bring that up is because sometimes you can think, hey, I don't think God can really use me. Or maybe I've, done, I've messed up my life. Or maybe I've done things that it's unforgivable. God could not love me. Good God cannot possibly forgive me. God cannot possibly use me for anything. So I don't want to even respond in any sort of what can I do for you, Lord, because I'm not even living as a, you know, righteously. I'm not even, you know, living well. But I just want to sh share that with you, that even in whatever you think of yourself, God still called Saul, Saul. He still calls you by your name in that, in that name of endearment. He calls me Jonathan, Jonathan. And then the question is, what is the question he's asking you? He asked Saul the question, why are you persecuting me? Because that's a, that, was a, that was a direct question that had to deal with Saul and what he was doing. I would say my challenge and my question to you is, what is God calling you out for? When he's saying, Jonathan, Jonathan, you know, what is God calling me out? You know, what is he calling me out to change? What is he calling me out to do? What is he calling me out so that I may respond in an obedient manner, in a surrendered manner? You know, Jonathan, Jonathan, why, you, you know, your anger is a problem, especially with your children. Your anger is a problem, right? What are you going to do? How are you going to respond? And so for each one of you, and I would say, God knows there's nothing you can hide from him. And he's going to say, why are you doing this? Or what are you doing? Or change. And all of that is in the purpose that you would respond to him. That you would respond to him in surrender. That you would respond to him in obedience. And like I said, I don't want you to think that, hey, God calls some people, but God can't call me. God called Saul. Okay, to become a Paul, and he became this big preacher. I'm just a kid, or I'm just a man, or a young person, a young woman. I'm not talented, or I can't do this, I can't do that. And here's what I'm going to say that God calls all people to do his work. And those whom he has called, he has a will, a purpose, a calling, a work that he wants to accomplish in your life. All God desires is that you would surrender and, and, and be obedient to his call. You know, in this passage, in Acts chapter 9 and then 22 and then 26, God called Saul. But do you know who also God called? He called Ananias. He called Saul to do the big work of evangelism to the Gentiles. But he called Ananias to do a equally important work of going to Saul, praying over him, and so that he would be, he, and, his, and his, he could regain his sight again. God calls big, small, everyone for, the, for his purpose, for his will, for his glory. 
In John chapter 10, verse 27, we read, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. My encouragement to you is simply this. If you don't know the Lord Jesus, then I strongly urge you that you would talk to someone Share that. I don't know if I can, if I hear the voice of God and maybe I'm stuck thinking that I am a Christian because I'm surrounded by Christianity, but I don't really have a personal relationship with God that he speaks to me and that I could hear and recognize his voice. Talk to those uh, leaders, those elders, those Sunday school teachers, share with them, let them lead you in scripture so that you may come to the knowledge of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And for those who know the Lord, let this be our answer. And let this be our question. And this, let this be our response. What shall I do, Lord? Or here I am, Lord. Let us be open to whatever God wants to use us in his life, in this life, um, so that he can accomplish his work. That is the immediate correct response. If he is your savior, if he is your Lord and master, then our simple response is, what shall I do, Lord? Let that be, I hope that's an encouragement and a blessing to you. Let's pray. Great God, our Heavenly Father, we are so grateful and thankful for this time. For me, Lord, just um, especially with this assembly um, and the time that um, Juben and I and family were, were there, we, it's still such a close uh, relationship, such good, warm um, feelings. And, and I'm just so thankful that you have sustained the assembly. You've blessed them. You've raised up elders and leaders and young people. And now to see this um, group of young people who I knew as kids now growing up to be young men and women. And Lord, I just commit them into your hands because in this world, there is temptations and distractions and difficulties and stresses and disappointments and loneliness and depression and all sorts of things to take us away from you. But we pray that in, in all of that, in all of the outside things that are happening, we pray, Lord, that all of us, and especially these young men and women, that they would hear your voice that they would tune out everything else, all of the nonsense, all of the, the static noise, and just to be in your presence, to hear your voice speak to them. And I pray, Lord, that you would use these men, these women, to for your glory, that you would use them in service of you, that in some way that they would be a godly influence, serving God in some way, little way, Whatever you talk to them, whatever you speak to them, Lord, we pray. We pray. I pray, Lord, that they would hear from you, that they would hear your voice through your word, through prayer, through your leading of your spirit, that they would hear your voice and that they would be obedient, a heart of surrender and a heart of obedience. I thank you for this time that we could just consider your word. It's, it's a word that you have given to all of us. It's not just me to them but it's for all of us to feed on. And we thank you that you are a God that, that nourishes us with your word. We pray that we would be obedient to it. We thank you and praise you. We thank you for this time that we could spend those um, in the assembly who, that here also who are leading the young people and, and coordinating and planning. We just pray for your blessings upon them that you would, uh, Lord, bless them for the work that they're doing, the sacrifice that they're doing, and that you would... Um, uh, richly reward them as well. So we thank you and praise you. We ask and pray all these things in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.